At first, true and falsely Jesus in the Bible Part 3. 3. The Trinity. At first, the Church Fathers explained the Trinity to mean an equilateral of gods. The God with three forms. They are co-equal, co-eternal gods. God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Every one of them is a separate being or entity. Yet they are not three gods but one God. It is three in one and one in three. None of them superseded the other. This concept began to take shape in the second century and was formulated in emulation of popular pagan beliefs then prevalent throughout Mediterranean lands. The pagan trinity as recast into church beliefs renders the one and only almighty God into a plurality of gods. It opposes logic and has no basis in any purported speech of God in any scripture. Some of the later church fathers realized the depth of the discontent with the obvious pagan multi-gods of the trinity. So, they thought up a more acceptable formula and cover up the pagan multi-gods with a token veneer of monotheism. They came with this. Trinity is not three gods, God, Jesus and the Holy Spirit. But it is one God with three essential attributes, that God would not be existed without them. These three essential attributes of God are the existence, entity of the essence, the mind, knowledge, wisdom and speaking, and the life, spirit. These three essential attributes were eternally existed with God without any beginning. It is impossible for God to be existed at any time without these three attributes. God is existed by His essence, speaks by His wisdom, His word, and lives by His spirit. He is one God, His essence, person, is called the Father, His word, knowledge are called the Son, Jesus, and His spirit is called the Holy Spirit. This new formula, coated with a gloss of monotheism, was the finalized concept of the Trinity. The Trinity's proponents deny the existence of three distinct gods in the guise of God, Jesus and the Holy Spirit. But they have chosen some essential attributes of God and divided them into three categories. The attribute of existence was directed to God's essence upon which they referred to Him as the Father, they combined the attribute of knowledge, wisdom and speaking into the attribute of the mind, and separated it from God's essence as a separate entity sharing the divinity with God, and called it the Son and directed it to Jesus. They also separated the attribute of life from God's essence as a separate entity, sharing also the divinity with God, and called it the Holy Spirit and directed it to Him. And in this way, the Holy Spirit is God Himself, and Jesus also is God Himself, but He was called Son because He came from God and was born of a human mother. Thus, with a token veneer of monotheism, the essential polytheism of the Trinity was masked. This new philosophy of the Trinity has no any supporting evidence from the words of God, nor from any prophet, or even from Jesus' words. What about the other essential attributes of God, such as the attribute of omnipotence, power, majesty, greatness, etc.? Is it not impossible for God to exist at any time without all his essential attributes? Why were only three attributes chosen in deference to the rest, while all are equally essential? God possesses the most perfect essence and attributes. None of God's messengers, Jesus included, ever described the knowledge, the word or the life of God are separate and distinct divine personalities. His attributes are not separate entities of his essence, but they are inseparable from him. Let us explore this concept of Trinity further. Had it been the true reality of God, surely it would have been revealed to Adam in order that he may teach his children and humanity the truth about God. The same holds true as regard to Noah, Abraham, Moses and even Jesus. They would all do their best to expand the Trinity in clear terms so that people may truly know their God. Yet, there is no statement nor any text attributed to any messenger or prophet of God in the Bible speaking of or explaining the dogma of the Trinity. Even Jesus himself, who is presented as one of the three forms of God, did not know of this dogma, nor did he preach it. All the true believers before Jesus and during his lifetime died believing in God as one and only one, not one in three and three in one, because there was no reference whatsoever for this concept. And if the Trinity truly explains the reality of the divine, why did it only appear among people many years after Jesus' ascension? Why did none of the previous messengers of God who came before Jesus ever speak of a Trinity? The Trinity is not just against the true and clear teachings of Jesus, but it is a false accusation against him. It is not supported or proven by Jesus' own statements. There are numerous biblical passages that outrightly oppose the idea of a Trinity. In Mark 13 32, Jesus said, No one knows, however, when that day or hour will come, neither the angels in heaven, nor the Son. Only the Father knows. How can it be that Jesus was the essential attribute of the knowledge of God, as the Trinity states? when in fact Jesus was negating his knowledge of the appointed day and hour to come. Was he then the knowledge of God without knowledge? Also, in Mark 11 12-13, now the next day, when they, Jesus and his disciples, had come out from Bethany, he, Jesus, was hungry, and seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves. He went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figure. 
If Jesus was really the knowledge of God manifested in human form, surely he would have known about the season of the figs. Had there been any divinity in him, he would not have troubled himself and walked all that distance to see if, perhaps, he could find some figs. Jesus' actions were distinctly human, utterly non-divine. Matthew 4 8-9 says, Again the devil took him, Jesus, up on an exceedingly high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Was Jesus God even when he was tempted by the devil, as the above passage recalls? And was the devil offering God's kingdom to God himself if God would fall down and worship the devil? We previously cited John 20:17, wherein Jesus said, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. So, if Jesus himself admitted that he had a God, why do people then make a God of him in the Trinity? And if Matthew in 27:46 claimed, falsely, that Jesus said, My God, my God why have you forsaken me? So, if Jesus was God, a part of a Trinity, was God here complaining to himself? Was God asking of himself some help in order to put himself down from the cross? And if Jesus was God in the Trinity and he was dead for three days, should it not be that all the three of the Trinity were dead also, since they are all one? Was there no God in the universe for three days, or there was a God but without knowledge because his knowledge, Jesus, was dead, for three days? Glorified is God, the Lord of honor and power. He is free from what the polytheists attribute to him. Also, Jesus already made it very clear and direct about how his nation could attain salvation. He declared that they must believe in God as the only one true God and Jesus as his messenger. He said, and this is eternal life, that they, the Jews, may know you the only true God, and to know Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. John 17 3. No belief in a trinity is included here. Only an uncompromising monotheism and a belief in Jesus, in full humanity, as God's messenger. What about the third side of the equilateral of gods, the Holy Spirit? How could the trinity make the life of God a separate and distinct person? While Luke in 11.13 narrated Jesus saying, If you then, evil know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? In this text the Holy Spirit is something given by God to those who ask Him. So, if the Holy Spirit is God in the Trinity, would God here give Himself or His life to those who ask? Or does God give a separate and distinct personality before those who ask? Or does God give away the life in the third person according to the mythology of Trinity? God is alive by his essence, not by another thing. And the life of God is one of his perfect essential attributes, belonging to him and inseparable from him. It cannot be given away nor it is to dwell in people. The Holy Spirit is not a name of God nor of his life, because he neither called himself the Holy Spirit nor did he describe his life with such terminology. The Holy Spirit is, in reality, one of God's creations, the angel Gabriel, he who was entrusted by God to reveal God's words to his messengers and strengthen them. We also read and hear the term Spirit of God or a Spirit from God, but none of these terms were meant to describe God himself. Rather, they also pertain to the angel Gabriel, or to what the righteous experience of feelings of tranquility, enlightenment, and such like, also his support, guidance and inspiration. All the messengers of God, Jesus included, were supported by the Holy Spirit, Gabriel. None of them ever preached that the Holy Spirit was God himself or his life. Surely, the Holy Spirit that God gives to those who ask him, as narrated in Luke, refers to a feeling of tranquility and guidance from God. The only instance in the entire Bible that stated the dogma of the Trinity occurred, past tense, in 1 John, for there are three who bear witness in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. 1 John 5 7. But this verse is no longer present in any of the revised versions of the Bible. It was omitted by scholars who recognized it as a deliberate interpolation, a forgery that does not occur in the oldest of manuscripts. 1 John 5 7 now reads like this, there are three witnesses. The Spirit, the water, and the blood, and all three give the same testimony. What about baptizing in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Matthew 28 19. Well even if Jesus said such thing, it does not prove the Trinity, because the verse speaks about names of three different persons, each having his own share in the baptism. God himself, the Son which is the righteous raised messenger, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, the angel who supported Jesus in his mission. Still another verse in Bible presents more of problem to those who insist upon belief in the Trinity. Jesus was received up into heaven, and sat down, at the right hand of God. Mark 16 19. The verse shows two separate, distinct entities beside each other. What about the third person, the Holy Spirit? Where is he? Should he not be sitting on the other side? And if Jesus was the knowledge of God as the Trinity says, so is his knowledge sitting at his right hand? These contradictions are unavoidable for those who persist in believing corrupt concepts of God.
They want to be monotheists because monotheism is the natural belief in God as consistently taught throughout the scriptures. But at the same time, they want to keep to their inherited tradition of the polytheistic dogma exemplified in the Trinity. When one thinks and speaks of the Trinity, one imagines three persons sitting beside each other. And when that Trinitarian wants to think or speak of monotheism, he has to merge the three into one God. Yes, Jesus ascended to heaven, but a monotheistic belief precludes any implication of Jesus being God's co-equal. The right hand of God here does not mean equality, but signifying the high rank of Jesus in the sight of God. Since God is qualified with absolute transcendence, God is above the heavens and all creatures, none is above him or beside him, and he is distinct and separate from all creation. While Jesus is within heaven, God raised Jesus up to heaven to save him alive from his Jewish enemies. Jesus is now subject to heavenly laws, away from the earthly laws. The 2000 years that have already passed here on earth count as just a few days up there. He will return to earth when his appointed death is near. Because Jesus, as a human being, must die and be buried in the earth. His second coming will correspond with the time of the coming of the false Christ, who will appear before the end of this present life with a false mission. Then, Jesus will kill this imposter, live for some more years, and eventually die and be buried. On the day of resurrection, he will be raised for judgment with all beings. 4 John 3:16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This verse is arguably the most famous verse of the Bible and has been translated into more than 1,100 languages. It is considered to contain the central message of the Gospel. In context, there is actually nothing extraordinary about John 3:16. A dialogue took place between Jesus and a Pharisee Jewish leader, by the name of Nicodemus, see John 3:1-21. The problem is the quoting out of context. One night, Nicodemus came to Jesus and confessed to him that he, Jesus, was sent by God, because of his miracles. Then Jesus answered him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God, John 3:3. 3, 3. Meaning, faith should be generated from above, heaven. And when a person beheld the heavenly truth, he would be as if born again. Nicodemus did not understand Jesus' words. So he asked, how can an old man be born again? He cannot enter his mother's womb and be born a second time. John 3 4. So Jesus explained that he did not mean a physical rebirth, but a spiritual one. The human being be born again, spiritual birth, by knowing the truth that came with the heavenly inspiration, the spirit, and grasping it. So, unless a person is spiritually reborn, he will not recognize the truth of the divine. The spiritual rebirth can be physically seen through the effects of good deeds and behaviors, just as the wind can be seen by the effect of its blowing and sound, John 3 5-8. But still Nicodemus did not comprehend Jesus' answers. He said, How can this be? John 3 9. Jesus, surprised, exclaimed, You are a great teacher in Israel, and you do not know this? John 3 10. Then Jesus criticized the Jews' ignorance and hard-heartedness, saying, I am telling you the truth, we speak of what we know, and report what we have seen. Yet none of you O Jews is willing to accept our message. You do not believe me when I tell you about the earthly things, how will you ever believe me then when I tell you about the heavenly, spiritual, things? John 3 11 to 12. Then he confirmed in John 3 13 his connection to heaven. In other words, he did not appoint himself to the people, but he was the gift of heaven to them. For he shall be lifted up spiritually in a high rank among them, to free them from their wickedness and bring them out of the darkness to the light. The problem was Nicodemus could not grasp what Jesus was saying. So, to solve this problem, Jesus employed another technique. He reminded Nicodemus about the Old Testament story of the earlier Jews with Moses, Numbers 21 5-9, a story that Nicodemus was surely aware of and understood. Numbers 21 5-9 tells of how the Jews complained to Moses, saying, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to die in this desert, where there is no food or water? We cannot stand any more of this miserable food. So God sent poisonous snakes among the people as punishment. Many of them were bitten and died. The Jews then came to Moses and confessed that they had sinned with their disobedience and asked Moses to pray to God to take the snakes away. So he prayed for them. Then God had mercy on them, and gave to Moses the prescription for healing by faith. Then God told Moses, to make a metal snake and put it on a pole, so that anyone who was bitten could look at it and be healed. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who had been bitten would look at the bronze snake and be healed. Thus, Jesus drew a parable between his mission and that of Moses before him.
In both cases God covered the Jews with his mercy and love, but in both cases, the Jews were ungrateful and recalcitrant. Jesus explained to Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the desert. Even so, the Son of Man must be lifted up. John 3:14. It was not the bronze snake that healed the ancient Jews, but by their faith that God would heal them by looking at the lifted bronze snake. Jesus in his discussion with Nicodemus used the story of the Jews of Moses' time to prove to him that he was also a symbol of the heavenly mercy and love. And he would be also the solution for the sinning Jews of his time. Jesus said to him, Whoever, of later should not perish but have eternal life. John 3.15 Jews, believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3.15 now the question to be asked is this, was Jesus telling Nicodemus that he would be lifted up physically for many years among the later Jews, just like the bronze snake? Surely not. 1. Although why God would instruct Moses to make a statue of a snake after he had revealed to that same prophet? You do not sin by making for yourself a carved image in the form of any figure. Do not sin by making a carved image in the form of anything, Deuteronomy 4 16 to 18, 25, does not quite make sense. And was he informing Nicodemus that he would also be as the lifted bronze snake that the later Jews should look at him while he is lifted up? Surely not. If the bronze snake was lifted up on a pole in the desert as a symbol for the sin of the ancient Jews, and it can be easily distinguished, realized and viewed by the bitten ones even from a far distance, so would Jesus be lifted up physically also as a symbol for the sin of the later Jews just as the bronze snake? Surely not. If the healing from the bite of the real snakes was by a symbol of the same illness, the snakes, was Jesus also the same illness just like the bronze snake? Surely not. So what type of lifting up Jesus was talking about? And how can he be easily distinguished and realized by the later Jews? Surely the apparent meaning of the story of the bronze snake does not befit Jesus, that he would be lifted up physically for years among the later Jews. Otherwise he would also be a symbol of sin as the bronze snake was. Rather, Jesus was explaining to Nicodemus that just as Moses lifted up the snake on a pole as a mercy from God, to heal and save from death any bitten Jew who had looked at the bronze snake with faith, for the same mission with the later Jews. Jesus would also be lifted up spiritually in a high rank among them, in terms of prophethood, honor, signs, the gospel and the support of the Holy Spirit, and the light that he brought with him to free them from their wickedness and bring them out of the darkness to the light. He was just a mercy from God to get them out of the darkness, and heal them from their sin when they had deviated from the teachings of Moses and other prophets. So, any later Jew who had faith in Jesus would not perish but have eternal life. Why did God lift up Jesus in a high rank among the later Jews? The answer is John 3:16. For God so loved the Jewish world, he covered them with his mercy by sending the Messiah Jesus to them to bring them out from the darkness into the light. He wanted their salvation, not their condemnation, John 3:17, because his mercy precedes his wrath. For God so loved the Jewish world, that he sent to them his chosen servant, Jesus, that any Jew who believes in him should not perish spiritually but have everlasting life in the hereafter. But he, of those Jews, who does not believe is condemned already. John 3.18 So, John 3.16 is a much misused and misunderstood verse. The world in the context of Jesus' mission is the Jewish world, as we have seen previously. Also, in John 3.19, it says, The light, Jesus, has come into the world but people, the Jews who did not believe in him, love the darkness. And in John 17, Eleven, Jesus said, I am no longer in the world. But they are, the disciples, are in the world. Jesus never took his mission to other nations outside the Jewish community and nor did his faithful disciples. Also, we saw previously in John 6:14, when the Jews saw the miracle of Jesus, they said, Surely this is prophet who was to come into the world, meaning to us, the Jews. So the world in John 3:16 never meant the entire world or all the nations of the world, but only a certain nation. Such a seemingly counterintuitive and restrictive usage of the term the world occurs elsewhere in the Bible. For example, and it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Luke 2 1. All the world here means all the Roman world, Roman Empire, not those peoples and lands beyond the authority of Rome. The word gave, in John 3 16, means sent. God also gave Noah, Abraham and Moses to their nations before Jesus. Jesus, the Aramaic speaker, did not mean the sacrifice and killing. While his son means the chosen servant, close to God, as we have discussed at length previously. And as also has been discussed, Jesus was never the only son of God but he shared that title with several other true prophets of God. As for the word begotten in the verse, it was never spoken by Jesus and nor did the author of John pen such a word. This is why this word is no longer found in the revised versions of the Bible. 
it was omitted upon revision by scholars who recognized it as a deliberate interpolation. It was a forgery not found in the earliest of manuscripts. It does not befit the divinity and the majesty of God that he should beget Osiris son, like earthly creatures do. The word whoever in John 3.16 means whoever believe in Jesus from his nation, the Jews. Did he not say, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the people of Israel? Matthew 15.24 And was he not used to send his disciples with the following instructions? Do not go to any Gentile, non-Jew, territory or any Samaritan towns. Instead, you are to go to the lost sheep of the people of Israel. Matthew 10 5-6 5 John 14 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except by me. Of course, in context, this verse makes perfect sense, in order for a person to go to his God, he needs a way for that. The ways to God are his prophets and messengers. So, in order for the person to receive God's mercy and salvation, he needs first obey and follow his designated prophet. And the prophet at that particular time was Jesus Christ. John 14 6 was an answer from Jesus to unexpected question from the disciple Thomas. The whole context was a dialogue took place between Jesus and his disciples in John 14 1 6. The author reported that Jesus asked his disciples do not be worried and upset. Believe in God and believe also in me. John 14 1. Then Jesus started to talk in parables to them, There are many rooms in my father's house, and I am going to prepare a place for you. And after I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to myself, so that you will be where I am. John 14. 2-3, here, Jesus was encouraging his disciples to remain steadfast in faith, so they can be with him in the hereafter. Then he immediately continued saying to them you know the way that leads to the place where I am going. John 14 4. Here, Jesus was emphasizing to them that he would be going to heaven and that they too would know the way to there, through keeping their faith in him. Believe in God and believe also in me. John 14 1. The disciple Thomas, however, did not understand Jesus' parable. Lord, we do not know where are you going, so how can we know the way to get there? John 14 5. So Jesus made clear for him, saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one goes to the Father except by me. John 14 6. Meaning, keeping the faith in him is the way to God. Surely Jesus was a way to God, not only for the disciples, but also for the whole Jewish nation. The Jews who did not accept the way, E.A. Jesus, God would not accept their faith or their deeds, because no Jew at that time could go to God except through the Messiah, Jesus. And those Jews who rejected Jesus, they were actually rejecting God who sent Jesus to them as a way to him. So, John 14 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one goes to the Father except by me, is appropriate for every messenger of God, not only Jesus. Every messenger was a way to God because he sent his messengers to be followed and obeyed. Every messenger is the embodiment of the truth due to his being inspired by God. Every messenger is the life because if any one of his people believed in and followed him, they would attain good in this worldly life and in the hereafter. Hence, no one from the people to whom God sent a messenger could come to God except through that messenger. To put it crudely, John 14 6 is yesterday's news, when Jesus was the way, appropriate and exclusive for the Jews of his time. Jesus did not cater in his address for anyone but his target audience, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Still, he did not abandon considering later generations. 4. He had announced another way to God to succeed his own. 6 John 14 26. Jesus said, But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and make you remember all that I have said to you. Here, Jesus specified the Counselor to come after him was the Holy Spirit, not a human messenger. But, elsewhere he prophesied about two different counselors to come after him, each with their particular assigned tasks to do. In John 16 12-14, mention is made of the Spirit of Truth, an inspired human being to come after Jesus. His assigned job was to proclaim a new message which was never spoken by Jesus. While John 14 26 talks about the coming of the Holy Spirit, the angel Gabriel, with a different job assignment, to teach the disciples and remind them of what Jesus had spoken, as they did not record his words in writing. 